conversation about your perspectives on manufacturing and exporting in the U.S. for insurance export. And uh, Dave has given us uh, a description of the Caterpillar process, the Caterpillar efficiency, and, and, uh, and the kind of product that they've export. Tom, maybe you could comment on your experience, and then and also maybe you can talk to about the Deming Center and how it uh, sees these issues. Thanks. Well, David, that was just a great presentation. Oh, thank I, you. I, uh, I love this stuff, and I was geeking out over there, taking a lot of oh. notes. <laughs> I borrowed a few uh, terms I'm going to use okay. uh, going forward, which thank is great. You. Just to give you a little background on my experience, I went to uh, Columbia Business School, and <coughs> I actually had uh, Professor Donaldson as one of my professors. <laughs> <laughs> four years old at the time, I was only about 26. <laughs> but uh, during my career, I, I ran several manufacturing companies, as uh, Jesse referenced, and but much different scale. We had, uh, uh, at the revenue was less than $500 million. We had about 1,000 employees. But we had a similar model uh, to Caterpillar, kind of a mini version. And we were able to export uh, almost 40% of our total revenues out of our factories in Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to start with my standard manufacturing uh, OR pitch. And I know that some of you struggle through some of these classes that guys like this teach, but uh, let me tell you something. I've been doing manufacturing and operations for 26 years, and if you choose to enter that field, you will not find a more interesting, diverse, rewarding, and wait for it, people intensive career in anything you can do in business. It, it will give you value added skills that will benefit you your entire career. And for example, today I'm in venture capital. <coughs> I use the things that I've learned in manufacturing every day that I'm, I'm at work. It's, it's a skill set that never leaves you and that not a lot of people have. And that's where you want to be in the future, is very specialized skills that not a lot of other people have. And the world will be a path to your uh, vocational door, I guess. And you don't have to be an engineer, either. I was an artsy. I was a uh, liberal arts major in college. So that is a, uh, a myth. You don't have to be an engineer. But uh, just getting to David's presentation, I think it was, it was excellent. I'm, I'm, like I said, I've run several companies in my career, and now I'm involved in venture capital. So I look at, I see like 100, 150 business presentations a year. And if there's, if there's a few things that I've learned in my business life, it's that business success is all about core competencies. You figure out what you do best, and then you bring that to bear in the marketplace as often as possible. And uh, you shouldn't have too many of those core competencies, but you should make sure that you know how to use them to gain competitive advantage. And if there is one company that has brought manufacturing to the front as its core competency, it would be Caterpillar. So the reason they've stayed ahead of all of those competitors up there is that they have focused on manufacturing as a core competency. It sounds obvious when you're making lots of big, heavy equipment, but it's not really that obvious. It's amazing. During the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, so many companies in the United States and Europe outsourced a core competency of manufacturing. And I'm not saying that that was necessarily bad in all cases. If you think of some industries, like, for example, textiles, the fabrication of clothing, it's not that surprising that companies that consider themselves clothing manufacturers would outsource manufacturing because it's not a place where you can bring to bear all those different skill sets that would enable competitive advantage um, as a core competency. So it makes sense to outsource that to a place that can give you what you need because there's not really ways that you can build uh, advantage over competition. <coughs> manufacturing, the kind of stuff that they make in Peoria and Decatur and North Carolina and Thailand. This is complicated stuff. We have the same kinds of machines in our factories in the Midwest, 
but they, they supersize everything. You know, if we make things that are this big, they're making things, they're, they're making these um, uh, dump trucks that are bigger than this room. And so you can imagine the tremendous complexity. <clears throat> what you want to do in business is get really good at the hard stuff. Be really good at doing those things that other people can't do easily. <coughs> and that's why I think that Caterpillar is so smart in uh, insourcing a lot of those things that, and I, I don't mean to name drop, but I know a couple of their competitors, like Terex, they used to be a division of GM. They outsourced a lot of their core manufacturing operations. And hence, they lost market share. They kind of lost their focus. <coughs> manufacturing has so many benefits to an organization. You know, what always freaks me out is that you guys know what a balance sheet is, right? You know that there are assets on a balance sheet. You know, what freaks me out is that capital investment is on a balance sheet, isn't it, as an asset? And so is inventory. So why the heck do so many people give up the ability to make something and instead put a whole bunch of stuff in inventory that they're not sure that they're going to sell? And if you, if you saw David's presentation, Caterpillar has worked this to a science. Like <coughs> Shingo Shingo, who, who created the Toyota production system said, you don't want to have cake on the shelf. You want to have cake mix. And that's what these guys do fantastically. With that four-tiered planning and production system, they build out the way that the product is going to be needed and they deliver better than any of their competition. Delivery is so critical in the construction business. So if you can deliver, you're going to be able to co uh, command a higher profit margin. People aren't going to care if they're paying a few uh, tens or twenty thousand dollars more if they can't open a mine that they need to get going. So that's just an, uh, one of the advantages. All kinds of other uh, advantages. Length of supply chain, inventory <coughs> dollars sitting on the balance sheet customer service level, control over quality, control over intellectual property and trade secrets. All of these things that you do when you make things internally. And you give those things up if you let other people make your product. <coughs> like I said, sometimes it's not necessary if you're a manufacturer. If you're doing relatively commodity-oriented processes, it might be better to have somebody else do it. But if you choose manufacturing as a core competency, you can be more successful than the competition. So uh, that's my uh, my general sure. comment. Thank you. Sure. Nelson, how does the Deming Center feel about U.S. competitiveness, and what are the other key elements that are that help what? That help the U.S. The, the Deming Center awards a prize for operational excellence. We do that for the last five years. So I also want to congratulate oh, him on, on Caterpillar because I mean, they're certainly awarded him. Um, I, I'm going to do the, use your examples basically as my comments. I, I, I concur with both of you guys in what you said. When you mention deeper business forensics, I mean, it just, and that becomes, it's very critical in, when you look at a firm and ask yourself the question, what wins orders? That determines how you should orchestrate. What Tom said is, one of the, if you were thinking of to do things in the U.S., it's probably the point where you have added higher value added. The things in Texas, as you mentioned, when it's not, I mean, then you can maybe outsource or do it somewhere else. But not for the type of things in the business of Thomas and Paul or Davis and Paul. The other thing is, once you determine what wins orders, then you have to think of what are the proper metrics to measure that we're doing the right thing. <coughs> and again, I'd like to show Dave what you said. Uh, safety, defects, on-time delivery, being things. That has to be aligned to what wins orders. And mistakes happen when you forget you have the wrong metric and then you do the wrong thing. Uh, one of our members of the Denver Center Board happens to be Paul O'Neill. He was the CEO of Alcoa, but he also was the Secretary of the Treasury. He took the same metric when he went to the to the Treasury Department and started measuring safety. It was critical of Alcoa. It doesn't really mean in, in, in except for the Franklin Mint, maybe. Mm. So he was perceived by, the, he wasn't a good secretary necessarily, maybe because he had the wrong metric. It wasn't the metric to do. So that's something that you have to be pay attention. 
And the idea of customization is also very important. Some cultures expect different ways uh, and you have to adapt and do that as well. So I'd just like to give you some, some examples based on, David said you cannot measure labor costs alone when you go abroad. And that's very critical. You have to look at supply chain. Uh, it's very myopic if you just look at firms, make mistakes by just considering just the labor costs alone when you go. A few years ago, I sat in with my colleague, Fang Chen, who was here in the, in t teaching a course in OM in the Asia Pro. Uh, and uh, one of my students invited the whole class, saying, come to visit my manufacturing facility that was in China. We took the train from Hong Kong to Dongguan, I mean, to visit. And what they were doing was a firm that was producing items for staples, uh, binders. Those were, uh, and they were having a whole shift devoted to producing that for staples. It was a <coughs> totally an extrusion product that was, uh, doesn't make these binders that you see. Uh, and the day we were there, the day before, they had lost that shift. And all of that went to Mexico. Mm. Not because of labor costs, because it was significantly cheaper in China. We went to Mexico because of the, you know, you could transport by the truck instead of by the boat. And you didn't need to have, and then the, the savings in inventory more than offset the labor cost that was in China. And that factory subsequently closed two years later. It closed in 2013 or 2012, mainly because of that not looking, being, getting business based on, on, the, on, on, the, on just labor cost alone. Uh, I can take you to Zara, uh, that manufactures things in Spain. The labor cost wage in, in Spain is significantly higher than in China, although, uh, although China is no longer the lowest cost producer in, 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 in Asia. But they win orders by speed and, uh, and uh, in short shipments. And by doing that, they don't have to have inventory. Uh, the amount of times that uh, <coughs> Um, you have little assortment, but a lot of different assortment every week. So they, uh, it, their model is very different, and most of the trendy clothes are produced in Spain, in factories that are 50, 60 percent busy, not 99 percent busy. And they need that, that amount of capacity for late orders. Um, so I think that I totally concur that you have to look at, if we're, if we're looking at high-value high added manufacturing, there's a lot of the, the U.S. And the U.S., by the way, like Dave mentioned, is number two manufacturer in the world after China. So it's not that we lost the number one a few years ago, but being number two is still significantly high in terms of production in this country. The other thing you have to look at, really, to me, is what is the future factory going to look like? And I think there are two elements here that come to play. One is robotics. I and mean, technology that Jesse mentioned before, sent us is that's going to change the, 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 the way that the labor costs will be affected as well. And disruptive technologies like adapt, uh, additive manufacturing, I don't know to what extent is being used in Caterpillar, but GE, there's not much commercialization of products, but you're thinking of using blades in the engine in the engines produced next to the factory that assembles those engines. So, yeah, and, uh, is, and that is going to disrupt the way things are going to be produced. Uh, if you're looking at customization, you look at Toyota, the, one of the models of Toyota is assembled finally. I mean, mass customization is another trend that is happening. That is going to happen I mean, and, and make that Toyota building the last portion of the car in Florida instead of having it done in Japan. So all these things will, will trend that U.S. manufacturing will grow in a different way. You know, we hear a lot about U.S. creative companies here. You're on the venture capital world mm -hmm. How important is the technology innovativeness of the United States to U.S. manufacturing? I mean, you could create here and then develop Apple does and manufacture overseas, but is our creativeness a particular leverage in our manufacturing uh, expertise and, and, and leadership? Uh, uh, definitely. In, in fact, one of my big criticisms in venture Whenever there's a hardware product involved, there's not even the consideration of, of 
making it in the U.S. They, they, because so many of the CEOs have no operational experience, <coughs> they completely ignore all these other costs we've been talking about and just look at the per unit cost. And, and it drives me nuts because I always say, look, we were talking about this before the, the uh, thing. I've never, I was running factories for many years, I never had one production, one pilot production one run that was right the first time. So why the hell would you order 10,000 units, right? That are gonna take six weeks to get here. So it's, it's so, if, if uh, having that technical capability in house, a lot of the venture funding companies don't have the resources to have the engineering and they'll often outsource it. But there's a tremendous ability in this country to do that engineering. They should do, they don't take advantage of it as much as they should. And it's, it's uh, the, the innovation side is there, the idea, the, you know, taking the idea into the final product is where so many mistakes are made and so much money is wasted. That's where more effort should be spent. Um, it's not the innovation, it's the application of the innovation where I see the biggest uh, screw-ups. I'd like to go to the audience for questions. Do we have any questions from the audience at this time? Uh, yes. Yeah. And, uh, David mentioned that uh, Caterpillar was able, uh, is able now to uh, produce a defect-free product, which is great. And I'm sure with good marketing, you will be able to monetize that in a way. But do you think that, uh, but I was just wondering that going from a Six Sigma environment to a defect-free environment would come uh, with a certain, a certain cost, like more investment. So do you think this continuous uh, research to achieve a defect-free uh, defect environment would allow you to have a lower uh, cost per unit and as such be more competitive or? Sure, that, that's a great question and, and let me, expand on that all of our products i mean anything in this lean journey it's always a journey and so so we're always trying to achieve defect free across the world right and, and we're not there yet but but we have some examples where the teams are doing a fantastic job as far as cost if you go back into the 80s and it was some of cost of quality in the 90s and, and things like that this is a very simple methodology that it's right in front of all companies within the US. We didn't spend a lot to do this. This is simply a very simple methodology of very specific quality gates within a product. And it's a quality gate whether it's in the office or whether it's in a factory. What should work look at, look like at a certain point, very specifically how is that work looked at, and do not pass that defect on. Doesn't cost anything to do that. It's amazing what happens on the innovation of people when you start applying that process. And you'd be surprised at how many companies and in academia, how ambiguous things are from perfect work. You know, in a case, hey, ensure this joint is tight versus ensure this joint is tight to a certain Newton meter starting on this angle. And this is a picture. That makes for perfect work when you do that. The last part of your question is absolutely it's a competitive advantage. In, a, in the case of a product, we had a product that took 12 days, start a line to ready to ship. We're now producing that in five days. In doing that, and I'll go to your speak, my cash to cash cycle just improved by 60%. Producing product faster, giving it to the market, I transact my cash faster. My whip has reduced, and my confidence in my supply chain just got better, shortening my lead times, or as we like to say in operations, eliminating just-in-case manufacturing and truly doing just-in-time. That's how I would answer. Okay, I, don't think it, I think there's a lot of misperception that it's expensive to be six have you heard of the double wallets? No. You know what they are? Tell us what they are. Um, yeah, in Bombay, there's a system of picking up lunch from somebody's home and yeah. delivering it to their yeah, work, so and they right. have Six Sigma efficiency. They do defect free with no capital investment. $20 is all they spend. So it's a mentality saying, I want them to describe, have a process that is error free. 
Next question. Next question? Yes. Thank you. So I have a question on Union. So I come from a Japanese manufacturing company, and when we discuss where to ship manufacturing, the topic of unions always comes up. Some countries are more industrial relations intensive, whereas some countries don't have a strong union. So how does that aspect like, affect your decision to go abroad? That's my first question. I have a second question. And in terms of manufacturing in the US, well, in relative terms, it is said that it's more heavily uni unionized, the manufacturing labor force in the United States. Now, is it a strength from your perspective, or is it a risk, or how do you perceive that opinion? Another great question. Um, in, in Caterpillar, we like to look, um, we've neutralized all of this to say it's about the employee, and we respect all employees. We have employees that, that make great work because of standard work, and they're either represented or not. I mean, we have a lot of non-union facilities, but within our union facilities, we still have to produce great work, on standard work, we happen to have a contract of labor to do that. And so we've gone about it in respecting the process, but applying the process and the work to be the central point versus focusing in on that relationship and that conflict. Now I will tell you, years ago, that was a big conflict within the company, and we've had to learn how to move on for that, and I think we've done that. Does it make a, a point on where we move things? I would say now much less than what it did years ago because we don't have those relationship type issues. It's really about total cost of ownership. And that other part becomes transactional when it comes to an agreement from a contract. Now I would argue with you if you look at China, same thing is happening. Germany, same thing. Be it without a union, there's still a contract right, of, of labor that's happening, and you're seeing that play out as well. So we just choose to respect the person, give them the standard work, and respect the situation we're in, be it union or non-union, and play it that way. Yes, come over here just a minute. Go ahead. Um, so, first of all, thanks for coming. Um, You're welcome. The way that you has been manufacturing has been discussed so far is sort of saying like look at the upsides of manufacturing in the United States, right? And it seems like a lot of what is discussed in terms of having an advantage is sort of the increased skill and the increased, um, uh, you know, like the product, uh, the, the the defect rate, right? It goes down, but it feels like that's more significant for you know, you know high uh, high quality products or like high value products like a Caterpillar truck versus a knickknack, right? And Looking at that, and the other big advantage is that um, there's a big consumption center uh, that is the United States and sort of this region of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, would would working with other regions, other countries that are near the United States, and encouraging them to uh, putting their economies in a better place to purchase these sorts of materials, help the United States sort of reciprocally um, in terms of really enhancing that demand, that, which makes it more profitable to bring high-skill manufacturing back to the United States. Hmm. Good question. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I'm a, I'm a huge believer that a, a rising tide lifts all boats. You know, as the, as the capitalist economies of these countries grow, you can see it in China. You know, why are, why are manufacturing wages rising in China? The country's becoming more prosperous. That's a good thing. So. It's, uh, it's, manufacturing is a great gateway. It's been used for centuries for countries to move up that chain of, of wealth. So we always, the products that we made were fire protection systems. We were protecting critical infrastructure. So that was always the argument that we made. We said, look, you, for a tiny amount of investment, you're gonna be able to protect this chemical plant, steel mill, these um, power plants that will build your, your economy into something bigger. So it, it's uh, those types of uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers that countries put in are very destructive and, and ultimately damage both importers and exporters. Don't forget the example I gave you wasn't high value with binders. It was just looking at the whole supply chain and looking right. at those costs. So you have to observe that. It's a good debate that you that you make or from that argument to start, 
But as Nelson said, that total cost of ownership and that entire lead time where companies have failed and not have been, they have not been excellent in that, and you, and you really pay the price for that. And it's amazing how much you get, 12 days to five days on producing a product like that. And I can tell you there's not a lot of capital investment to do that. It's huge. Well, it reduces your risk of operations too. It's Absolutely. It's risk, it's cash, it's the whole model and the rules when you do something like that. That's right. Impressive. Another question on this side, yes. Uh, we are in the generation that champions uh, technology. I like, for example, people like to work for Facebook, Google, or high tech companies. Uh, was attracting and retaining talents an issue or an advantage during this 15 year generation? No, great, great question. He was really posing the question around uh, working for Facebook and Google and high tech. And is it a, an issue of attracting talent, you know, within today's or, or during that time that I talked about? And I would argue that it's still an issue from the, the talent discussion and where we're going. And real quick, and I'm going to respect the time, would be it, it's really about the perceptions of manufacturing and today's manufacturing. Now, as we look at manufacturing and Caterpillar and look down and take the roof off, there's pretty much any discipline that you can talk about from electrical engineering and manufacturing to physical welding, right, of products and fabrication. But the environment that we do these in are, are not the environment that people may think of. These are very clean, modern factories. And in fact, some of our challenge has been finding the skill set to be able to imagine we have workers that are operating $2 million machines to produce product in some case. In some case, you know, inexpensive machines, but complex angles and things like that. So, you know, finding that talent and doing it. Yeah, it's an issue, and in some cases, we put our own universities up in Thurgalore, India. We've put a university up to say, we're not going to go out and find workers that come in off the street are going to do Caterpillar spec welding. And so we're going to teach them from ground zero, and by the time they're done, they'll have the ability to do that. And so many companies have different methods to do that. It's a challenge, but I don't think it's something that we walk away from all companies, and I think Tom would say it, are in that, in that challenge. It's really interesting. In the United States, there's a real cultural difference between different regions. Because in, in the Northeast, for example, there's very little, there, there's not very little, there's still a, a fair amount of manufacturing. And in California, but, but it's not visible, and it's certainly much less than it was. California is the same way. However, where I'm from in, in Michigan, there, uh, the, the northern Midwest uh, is, is very manufacturing intensive still, even though the media always shows you pictures of Detroit as like this bombed out shell. It's really not that bad. Parts of it are, but there, there's still a lot of manufacturing going on. There are lots of people that go to the university and plan to work in a manufacturing career when they come out. So it, it, it's, uh, it's not as pronounced as the media may lead you to believe. But certainly getting the best people is, is always a challenge. Some people don't want to move from San Francisco to Cleveland, for example. Is that surprising? <laughs> so how is it in Brazil for them? We are actually having a hard time to attract people to engineer. I am an engineer, but I work for a consulting company. My friends are working for banks. Uh, not for high tech companies because we don't have many high tech companies. But I, I believe that some disruptive technologies are maybe putting the economics back to the manufacturing supply chain because of 3D, 3D printing and mobile and some things, but not as fast as I would expect. No, so Interesting. Yeah. Next question, yes, the back. I'm curious to know what fraction of a typical caterpillar tractor, such as a uh, caterpillar product, such as an excavator, is uh, manufactured in house. That is, what proportion of the sale price is value added by caterpillar, and what part, what fraction of the components are supplied by outsiders, 
and whether a large fraction of these outside firms are among those that you mentioned were highly uh, US-centric and therefore you are concerned for their future? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so some of that, and I'll, I'll be up front, as we said, the, the rules of engagement here, so, some of that we don't talk about as far as specific breakdown in content. I, I just, I'll just say that up front, but let me talk philosophically about where you're going. What we do have is this. One, we have an excavator market that's in 14 sales regions, and we produce that product in, in, in four or five different continents, right? And so we're producing an excavator in Japan. We produce an excavator down um, in Texas, right, today. And we were producing it in Aurora, Illinois. We also produce an excavator over in Gosselies, right, France. So we're, we're around the world. And in China, we produce those excavators. In that, we have suppliers that are local to that region that supply components for that excavator as it's built in that particular country of origin. Are there certain ones that come from a source, right, that, that, has, that, that provides it to most? Sure, there are some suppliers to do that, but our model is to try to get a local supply base. So the ones built in Texas would have a big content of probably Mexico suppliers or U.S. suppliers because we're right there within that region and that allows us to take advantage of a very, very slick supply chain. And the same thing in China, we've had local suppliers that would produce products of excavators that are produced within China for that philosophy reason. And hopefully you can understand, I don't want to break down that, that content. But I do know it. <laughs> uh, let's think about the products a little more. So uh, these are durable goods, and, and they last a long time. Yes. And uh, the, so, so and then downtime is not allowed. So you have customers around the world and these things break down. And how do you provide after sales service? Ah, great. Well, it's part of our business model, right? And in Caterpillar, we are, our business model is what we call seed grow harvest. Seed is our field population that we produce, produce the machines. We grow that population uh, as we continue to, to fill out the business model and the harvest part of the business model is aftermarket or service and support. And so a big part and a big key to our company is after, aftermarket sales and service parts. And we spend a lot of time on that. We compete very aggressively on that. And I will tell you it's a competitive advantage for us because in times of, again, market highs and market lows, you can always look at aftermarket parts and sales as a key part of uh, your business model. And keep in mind, a tractor, and I won't get the specifics, you do a big tractor that is out there, we look at that as an annuity because our products are built to be rebuilt in some cases 10 times over, and there are parts that go along with that. It's very different. I came from the IBM, and uh, very different from the technology sector where obsolescence drives That's the parts right. out very quickly. And when I joined the Caterpillar board, the first thing I was amazed at was when I looked at the cap finance and I looked at their inventory in the technology sector when you're in the finance company. I was part of IBM's credit corporation for many years. Inventory is, is deadly because it is, becomes obsolete, right? Not so with a bulldozer, right? A bulldozer has value and you're looking to place that bulldozer so it can, you know, be used and you can sell parts to that owner for a long period of time. So you have to get your mindset around a very different kind of model than you do in the tech sector. Uh, it's a fascinating business. And, and, and by the way, 24 to 48 hours anywhere in the world, we say when you buy a Caterpillar, you get the company. What we mean by that is we're going we're gonna to have that part to you in 24 to 48 hours anywhere around the world. So does that mean that you're going to keep a lot of inventory around the world? Yes, sir, it does mean you could keep a lot of inventory until you get into what I'm talking about here. And this is cultural change too within Caterpillar and our, our competitors, and I know them. When you look at their turns, they have some of the same issues. We look at it as this. You, you can, by science, you can understand how products turn, how parts turn, 
and you can scientifically place high runner parts where they need to be in the world. Low runner parts, you have different strategies for that. Some may be that you share that burden with your suppliers or vendor managed inventory, right, that you can pull out from your supply base at time of need. You may have to pay more for that, but there's different strategies that you can do to lessen the burden of that. But I will tell you the advantage of that harvest part of our business model is much better than carrying the inventory load that we have to carry around the world. Yeah, I'm curious about your vision for, for the next uh, maybe decade about the manufacturing process. If you see a, a real revolution with 3D printing or what other technologies you see are gonna do, are gonna revolutionize the way we manufacture products. Um, well, yes, it's going to change a lot. Uh, one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most uncovered stories in the American economy, in the global economy, the past 10 years has been the advent of uh, digital controls. Formerly, analog controls in production were very much all or nothing. So imagine the classic production line that you see. Um, you've got stations that are doing different machining operations or welding or whatever, gauging. Uh, used to be kind of all or nothing. The line was either running 100% or it wasn't running at all. So with digital controls, you can operate just certain stations, you can operate the whole line slower, it's infinitely variable, and what's that, what that has done is similar to what the SAS model has done in IT. It's lowered the cost of manufacturing, and it's lowered the threshold of automation tremendously, and this evolution is continuing today. So what that, how that affects the more developed economies is that it's allowing the more developed economies with higher labor costs to do more manufacturing, because the threshold for automation, both in terms of quantity and capital employed, has come down. So that trend is going to continue. 3D printing gets a lot of press and a lot of pizzazz, but as David knows, you know, it's really hard to 3D print a uh, bulldozer blade. <laughs> and, and that takes you about six years, probably, and, uh, with the additive of the metal. 3D printing is a great technology. It's going to be great for spare parts, for you know, smaller runs. That, but the, it takes a long time to 3D print things. I think the digital controls and the open source software is another big thing. It used to be. It was all embedded systems, you know, the firmware was there, it was made by, you know, Schneider or um, Johnson Controls or, or Siemens or somebody, and then you had this proprietary operating system. I, I'm an investor in a, in a robotics company that moves parts around in factories, and you know, we're, we're just going with open source Java-based operating systems and firmware that, you know, two guys in a garage can write. So the this is, it's a huge topic, but yes, things are gonna change a lot, yep. and it's going to favor the more developed countries that have higher skilled labor who can uh, be very flexible and can deploy all these advantages. And I think that's another point that I've always felt. If labor can leverage capital, they can be competitive with the world. And they have, labor has to learn to work with capital, and leverage their skill to get more out of it. And it's not just, it's not just, we're not talking engineering degrees. We're talking technical degree, you know, technical skills that CNC operators on a, on a factory floor that just have a, that have a, a high school education and maybe one year of vocational school can do. And it's also that cultural difference. One of the advantages that the United States and maybe other countries that I'm not familiar with have is the, the, the people are willing to try things and they're encouraged to do so by their bosses. So if the, the cost of failure is pretty low. It's not a big problem to make a mistake. Other, other countries that is, the workers are not as flexible, they're not as willing to point out improvements to their supervisors. They're not as willing to make uh, you know, uh, improvements on their own. Um, Japan has a tremendous culture of that. Um, this country owes a huge debt to Japan for all of the principles that the Deming Center um, uh, espouses today, 
and the work of um, Mr. Shingo and the Toyota production system really saved manufacturing in the United States. Um, I just want to add to Eduardo, I agree with, with Tom in the, the robotics. I think that will be a, a big change in technology. I'm more optimistic in 3D printing, because I think it's a matter of material science that needs to be developed to have different things that we want to use it uh, significantly, and the size of the machine. Mm -hmm. the size are very small. But I think that that will happen uh, in the next few years. Uh, and that will be very, uh, change the way manufacturing is done. And again, I agree, it would, inc it would increase my, the, the footprint of that being done here because it would require that higher level of skill. One time for one more question. Many of the tools you mentioned, the particle management, e manufacturing, zero accident environment, are well known. How do you ensure that your competitors are not going to use those tools and get the same advantage as you have now. On the other words, how are you going to maintain your competitive advantage over the next 10 or 20 years? Yeah, great, great question. <coughs> Number one, I didn't show you the whole recipe. <laughs> <laughs> but no, two, I would say that you're, you're right in that, that some of this is not a secret sauce. But my being here and doing this would say we feel confident because it's really about the execution. And you know, where, where you can execute and execute right on the model is the competitive advantage. The toughest part for companies to do is finding that execution. I'm pretty proud about Caterpillar. If you look at our competition, they will look and say, they will marvel at our dealer relationship, our distribution relationship around the world and they will want that. It's no secret, it's out there. Executing to it is a different game. The previous company I worked for was Harley Davidson Motor Company for 17 years and you, know, you wonder why I used to be 110 motorcycle manufacturers and then that went down to two in the United States. And then every, why isn't, hasn't it gone up? Because as people get into the market they try to build 400,000 motorcycles a year, they find that it's pretty difficult because of execution. In the Caterpillar's case, we're counting on the execution, the standard work, the culture we have, and the end-to-end -end model that we have will be our advantage as we continue to go on. And others have their, their advantages they have. We know the results that we'll get here. The other thing I would add is, having been at IBM for a lot of years, there's always reinvention. That's right. You always find new things to do, new ways to do it, new efficiencies, new productivities. That's what the best companies do. Yeah, and Jesse, to finish up, and I, I like that. Remember the slide I showed. Last 10 years, great results. We could have just stopped. But pulling out introspection and looking to go even further than what Jesse's saying, from good to even great, that's what we're going to continue to do. So five years, 10 years from now, no matter where we are, someone's going to say, OK, this is pretty good. We need to go even further. Well, thank you very much. I would like to thank my panel, Dave and Tom. Thank you. And Nelson, thank you very much. I would also thank Kathleen Rivestone for helping put this program on from the Richmond Center. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming tonight. This has been great. I really appreciate your attention tonight. I hope you learned something. Thank you. So.